Today we're looking at El Elyon, the Most High God, and the sixth in our series on the names by which God chose to reveal himself to men. As I've meditated on this subject over the years, it's really hit home that so many problems, so many questions are resolved when we make an effort to know God as he wants to be known. And these names, Elohim, Yahweh, Adonai, El Shaddai, and El Elyon from Genesis, the book of beginnings, define his essential nature. He never ever changes, so if we really want to know him, this is how. He's given us all the clues about his identity in our consciences, all around us in creation and in his word. And if we'd only make the effort to search him out without preconditions and with an honest heart, we'll find him. The problem, of course, is men have their own idea what God ought to be or come with preconditions and too often base their lives on falsehood. 20 years ago here in the UK, one in 10 people said they didn't believe in God. And now today that's increased to one in four. But rather than ask, do you believe in God? The real question we should be asking is, what kind of God do you believe in? We'll talk more about this in the final instalment next time, but I hope you've been enjoying these messages. Hi, this is Bible Sense, future proof wisdom from the Maker's Handbook, and I'm Neil Turner. The Word of God washes us, and the more you study it, then the more it divides between what's soulish, our natural, mental, and emotional makeup, and what's spiritual that brand new, incorruptible nature born again from above in your thinking. The Bible's rather like a builder's plumb line, a perfect standard against which we can measure our lives and beliefs. Today, again, we'll examine another aspect of God's nature. He's the same God, but just like looking at a mountain from a different side, we're going to see another perspective of who he really is, what he does, and in this time, in relation to the Gentiles, those people of the world apart from Israel. As usual, there's a question for you to consider and a memory verse at the end of the session. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and if you want to know when new videos are posted up, then please just tap that bell symbol. A few years ago, I was stood in the Jordan Valley on the flat and arid plain north of the Dead Sea between the Judean hills and the hills of Jordan. It's a stunning ancient landscape and one through which Joshua would eventually lead Israel out of the wilderness and into its promised land. It was here, some 400 years or so before Joshua, that a confederation of tribal kings had kidnapped Abram's nephew Lot from Sodom, where he'd been living. Abram pursued this raiding party north as far as Damascus, which is in modern day Syria. He rescued Lot, plundered the vanquished tribes, and then, returning south, approached the city of Salem. Here Abram had an encounter with one of the most mysterious characters to be found in scripture. Let's turn now to Genesis 14 and read about this meeting, shall we? And it reads, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of the Most High God. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand. So here we have the first mention in scripture of God Most High, which in its original Hebrew is El Elyon. Now, if you remember from our last message on El Shaddai, we saw how El is the most ancient, basic name of God and means might or power. The Hebrew word Elion means the highest in a series or the chief amongst an order of those who are like in nature. It doesn't just mean higher or a bit further up, but the very highest in a hierarchy. Now this order or series or hierarchy all have something to do with links that links them together, some common characteristics by which they're related. El Elyon, the Most High or the Highest, figures around 40 times in the Old Testament, starting here in Genesis, but with most mentions in, in the Psalms and, and Daniel. In the New Testament, the majority of mentions will be found in Luke, which we'll examine a bit later. So just who was Melchizedek and why is he significant for the name of El Elyon? He's certainly a mysterious enigmatic figure, subject to much discussion, and it might help us to spend a moment or two just to understand him a little better. Melchizedek comes out from Salem, now Salem is the same word as Shalom, the Jewish greeting for peace. This city of peace, Salem, later becomes Jerusalem and interestingly is where, as we saw in an earlier message, Abraham will eventually bring his son Isaac to Mount Moriah for sacrifice. Melchizedek's similarities with Christ are amazing and some have speculated this actually was Jesus. So is that the case here? Well, I don't think so and I'll tell you why. 
We've seen through this teaching series how, in every other instance, when God revealed himself in human form in the Old Testament, that men fell down and worshipped him. And while Abraham treats Melchizedek with huge respect and pays him a tenth of, the, of his spoils of war, Abraham doesn't actually worship Melchizedek. Melchizedek clearly wasn't descended from Abraham, so by definition he, he must have been a Gentile. As you'll know, the Bible separates mankind into two groups, Israel, the descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob, and the Gentiles, which are every other tribe, tongue, people and nation apart from Israel. So that includes me as an Englishman, for example. To find out more about Melchizedek, we need to jump forward to Hebrews, and you've got three full chapters there, chapters 5 to 7, where we learn, for example, he is without father or mother or genealogy, and that he has neither beginning of days nor end of life. Curious indeed. The writer also tells us the lesser, who is Abraham, was blessed by the greater, that is, Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. This passage also makes it clear Jesus is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. In other words, this priest is what we call a type of Jesus, someone who foreshadows his typical characteristics and his nature, but wasn't Jesus himself. On meeting Abraham, he pronounces a blessing, proclaiming Abraham is of Elion, the Most High God, and the first mention of this name in our Bibles. So by now you should be learning that the first mentions in Scripture normally show us the fundamental truths of a subject, and this is no different. So, because El Elyon is revealed by a Gentile, we may safely assume this name primarily concerns Gentiles. And as we go in on in our study, we'll see this confirmed throughout Scripture again and again. Check it out for yourself. Amazingly, almost every mention of the Most High is in the context of the Gentiles. Literally, he is the highest God to them. Now, remember what I said earlier about how El Elyon means the very highest of a series or the top of a series of beings? Well, 1500 years later, of course, he would be manifested of Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Jesus is the supreme boss, the head of all rule and power and authority, and every name that is named in this age and also in the one that's coming too. Every knee's got to bow to him, every king, queen, prime minister, president, dictator, despot, chief executive or managing director. Folks, no matter who you work for, no matter what government you're subject to, they all ultimately work for El Elyon. And it is he, and he alone, who allows them to continue in power until he decides otherwise. Now that's a useful key in prayer, isn't it? OK, let's jump now into Daniel to see more of this. Daniel's where we get to see El Elyon in, in action amongst the Gentiles. In this case, Babylon, the superpower of the time. Picture the scene. How the Jews have been taken captive and that a few young men were chosen to perform special duties in Nebuchadnezzar's government. Now, because of his great practical wisdom, Daniel has risen to great favour with the king. And I recommend you study Daniel for yourself and mark wherever you find El Elyon, the Most High, because it's the key to the whole book. We all know the story of the fiery furnace, and here, from Nebuchadnezzar's own mouth, he calls in the name of El Elyon for them to walk out of the fire. A few verses later, Nebuchadnezzar's preaching again, now about how El Elyon rules in the kingdom of men, a subject that Paul unpacks for us in Acts chapter 17, where we learn again how the Lord doesn't live in a temple built with human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. In Genesis, we saw with Melchizedek, the priest of El Elyon, that there was no reference either to sacrifices or a temple. Stephen's sermon, shortly before he's martyred in Acts 7, confirms again that he lives in a temple made without hands. And we know since Pentecost it's the body of the believer, isn't it, that is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So without sacrifice, how are we going to please him? Well, we please the Most High, as the psalmist says, by paying him with our vows and by doing good which we'll look at later in a few minutes in Luke's Gospel. What this boils down to is El Elyon wants us to comply with his nature, or, if we put it very simply, just to be like him. As the highest, Jesus is our example, our head, our leader, so we must replicate his nature and works in our, in, in our places, in that hierarchy. Psalm 82 tells us man's like God, and that we have this divine capability. So, of course, in the fallen nature, the fact can result in evil, but consider man's works in science, medicine, industry, music, the arts or adventure or charity. Sometimes even in the wicked we'll see these sparks of the divine as, as, as men share the likeness of El Elyon. 
Of course, it's only when we're born again and receive our new heart and nature that we inherit this properly. Again, in Acts, written by the Gentile, Dr. Luke, Paul goes on to explain how the Lord oversees the boundaries of Gentile nations. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this in order that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So let's be clear about this. Our God reigns. He draws the borders of the nations on the map and he moves them whenever he wants to. He's just done it with Brexit, for example. El Elyon promotes kings and fires them too. He elected Donald Trump and the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, even though the mainstream media didn't want that. So when we're charged by Paul to pray first for the government so that we will live a peaceable life, that's a huge responsibility and one I hope you're taking seriously. Like I said, study Daniel for yourself and you'll get a wonderful picture of El Elyon. How it is the Most High who gave Nebuchadnezzar his kingdom, how he took it away and how all dominions would serve him. You'll notice too how through judgment of his pride that Nebuchadnezzar finally becomes a believer and one day I believe you'll meet him in heaven. Okay, let's get into Luke's Gospel, shall we? Where we find five specific references to the highest, the most in any of the Gospels. Now theologians generally agree that Luke is the Gospel for the Gentiles. Why? Well, firstly, it was written by a Gentile, Dr. Luke, the only Gentile author in your Bible. Study it and you'll see it emphasises God's relationship with men, typified by Jesus' response to the Gentile Roman centurion a few chapters later. It doesn't major like Matthew's Gospel on the Mosaic Law, for example, either. In Luke, Jesus is described as the prophet of the highest. The angel Gabriel himself, who's part of this heavenly hierarchy, visits Mary and tells her Jesus will be the son of the highest. In Luke 6, Jesus teaches his followers, love your enemies, do good, lend without expectation of return, because you are children of who? The Most High, El Elyon, as Christ wants us to be like him, do his works, share his nature, and take our place in his order, his line, and that's how we please him. Before we finish, I'd like just to dip into the epistles, Paul's letters, for a little more on the idea of hierarchy in relation to how it's organised in the heavenly places. In his letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul describes how the Father raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Over in Colossians, Paul says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So these two passages show us Jesus is supreme over all created beings, both here on earth, but also in, in the heavenly realm too. And if you study Daniel, you'll read how his prayers were opposed by someone called the Prince of Persia. There's also mention of a Prince of Greece. And between them, these powerful spiritual beings are responsible for Eastern and Western thinking in rebellion against God. They still operate today. Just look at how Iran, for example, opposes Israel, or how humanism from Greek culture drives political correctness which is systematically trying to destroy Christianity. Their boss, Satan or Lucifer, is yet another created being who rebelled and fell and is described by Jesus as the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air. I don't know whether you've ever noticed, but Satan himself in Isaiah 14 describes his proud ambition to be like the Most High. This is very real, folks, and there's a whole unseen realm, literally comprising organised principalities and powers, demons and angels, spiritual beings, who influence our lives and seek to impose Satan's agenda on it. It's a war zone, and the sooner we understand that and take up arms, the sooner Christ's kingdom will come. On the other side, we have two archangels, or ruling angels, Michael, described in Daniel as your prince, who stands over Israel and fights with the dragon, Satan, in the book of Revelation. And then there's Gabriel too, which means warrior of God, who you'll also find in Daniel, and who brings the message of the incarnation of Mary. Angels watch over us. Our children too all have a guardian angel. 
Revelation describes a hundred million angels saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and as such as is in the, are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honour and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Wow, now if that doesn't blow your socks off, I don't know what will. Paul's teaching in Ephesians and Colossians makes it clear there's a whole vast organisation of heavenly beings, both holy and serving God, but also those who are in full rebellion against him. But they all ultimately are subject to Christ. Now this is a vast subject and we're not going to go into details today, but just to be clear that the Most High is their boss too. And as we saw with Job in a previous talk, Satan has to ask permission before he's allowed to sift us. So this is El Elyon. Now here's your question for today's talk. Do you know your place in the kingdom of El Elyon? Do you understand where you're supposed to be and what your specific role is? If not, I want you to ask your heavenly boss and he'll tell you. As a practical aspect of this, maybe as a father, a mother or an employee, for example. But there's also a spiritual side to it in prayer ministry or spiritual warfare. Jesus gave us all a bag of talents and one day he's going to ask you, what did you do with them? The rewards are huge, but the penalties for wasting them are severe. So if you've been sitting on your hands and just enjoying the view, you need to get stuck in, brother and sister. I'm going to leave you today with Psalm 91, which will also be your memory verse. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, El Elyon, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Notice this shelter is only for those who are dwelling, abiding in his shadow. This blessing is conditional and only for those who fulfil the conditions. Hit the subscribe button to stay in touch and the bell icon to get reminders when new videos are posted up. As always, please share this teaching with those you see fit and click the thumbs up button if it helps you today. You can check out the AmigaProgram.com website too, which, which contain more end time resources. And I'll see you next time on Bible Sense in the final part of our series when I'll bring it all together for you and we'll see how these names perfectly complement our Father, His Son Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Thanks for listening.